Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I'm going to talk about the first two of John Wyndham's books that I have ever read. I know, it took me a very long time, but I actually didn't know who John Wyndham was or that he was even like a classic SF author until some years ago. I learned that from booktube, it's a little bit surprising. Um, and then of course a couple of his books appeared in very pretty hardcover SF Masterworks editions, and I finally got two of the three and I read them in September. And I was very pleasantly surprised. I enjoyed both of these, particularly The Day of the Triffids, a lot more than I thought I was going to. So let's talk about these books. I'm going to start with The Day of the Triffids because it's the one that I read first and it's also my favorite of these two. This was published in 1951, yes, and I think this has a lot in common with like The War of the Worlds. I do not know how big of an influence H.G. Wells was on John Wyndham, but that was my first impression when I cracked open this book, is it just gave me Wellsian vibes. <laughs> Maybe it's because of the slightly old-fashioned tone, just the way that the story is told, the viewpoint. It reminded me so much of The War of the Worlds and a couple of other things I've read by Wells. And this was a really pleasant comparison for me because I've always enjoyed H.G. Wells' style and his voice and that kind of old-fashioned air to the science fiction, even if I haven't always loved his plots or ideas. So that was a really good first impression of this book. And then the more that I got into it, the more I thought that it had aged really well and was still like a really good catastrophe novel for the modern day. This story is kind of a dual catastrophe. Two separate things happen that compound each other and they might be related. One may have caused the other or one may be taking advantage of the other, but it's never really said or known for sure. The first thing is that roughly whenever this book is set, I think it's vaguely after World War II, uh, these things called triffids have been created, discovered, whatever. They're these very giant plant-like structures. They're kind of carnivorous. They've got poison sacs. And oh yeah, they can walk. <laughs> and they're kind of dangerous and super weird, but they are um, used for agricultural purposes, kind of like rounded up like cattle in a way. And so they're very useful and eventually just sort of melt into the background. People don't pay them much attention even though they are dangerous and weird and nobody really knows where they came from. The second thing that happens is that a strange comet passes the earth and one night pretty much everybody around the world goes outside to see the comet. And the next day, anybody who was exposed to the light from the comet is blind, permanently blind. Except for those few people who didn't go out to see the comet or had their sight protected for whatever reason. So all of a sudden, almost everybody on the planet is blind and they are easy prey for all of the triffids who, did I mention that they're carnivorous? <laughs> the story follows the perspective of Bill Mazin, who had previously worked in an industry researching triffids, so he's very familiar with them, and he actually retains his sight because he had been attacked by a triffid, and he had been in hospital with like bandages wrapped around his head. And so when everybody wakes up and he's like, I can see, but nobody else can, yeah. <laughs> so. I think, like, just cutting to the chase about what I feel like this book is actually about, it is, like, when civilization pretty much collapses overnight because nobody can see, nobody can do anything, and everyone's kind of hysterical, what do you do next? If you can see, if you are able to function and to help people, what should you do? Like, morally, what should you do? But also, what are the options for saving your own life as everything collapses around you? And that's kind of the journey that Bill Mazin goes on. He does encounter some other people with sight, and there are debates about what they should do. Roughly speaking, there's one group that thinks that they're morally bound to 
try to help and save as many blind people as possible to help them find food, to help them find shelter, to stop them from killing each other, and basically to stay in the cities with them if possible. And then there are other people, like this other group, that just says, we need to get out of here, we need to get out of the cities, we need to help ourselves, try to preserve some knowledge from civilization, like agricultural practices, because otherwise we won't have food. Is it kind of like sinking all of your resources into something that probably won't work anyway? It's an interesting discussion and not an easy one either. There's no like real good answers given in the story. And that is what I really, really enjoyed about this. There were some good characters, some good moments, lots of debate. And I think the way that people reacted to this event is still pretty realistic for how things might play out today in a global catastrophe. I mean, I hope we never have to deal with something on this scale, which is like pretty much overnight collapse, <laughs> but it really played out in a way that I think we would expect these things to go. I didn't find any of it to be unrealistic, and I honestly thought it would be unrealistic because this book is like 80 years old. <laughs> So I really, really enjoyed it. The other thing that I really enjoyed about this is that there are a lot of women. And now I have a very low bar, actually, when it comes to the representation of women in older science fiction. I'm usually pleasantly surprised if there is even a single female character given a name who maybe isn't just the girlfriend or isn't just the secretary. So it surprised me a lot when pretty much the the other main character of the book is a woman, Josella. Yes, she's a love interest, but she and Bill, it's like their story is not just they've fallen in love and she is a damsel in distress. There's more to it than that. And there are plenty of other women in the story as well um, who don't just fall into the secretarial role, I guess. And I was also really happy about that. It's not perfect and there are some opinions and attitudes towards women that are said in this book that I didn't completely agree with, but what the, the impression I got from this is that it, the story was not ignoring the existence of women by any means and actually spotlighted them in some cases, like what happens to women in this sort of disaster. And the fact that it didn't shy away from that either, I thought was very interesting. And I can say I would recommend this. If like, if you want to pick up something by John Wyndham, this is probably a good place to start. The other John Wyndham novel that I read is The Chrysalids. This was published in 1955, so a couple of years after the Day of the Triffids. I have more complicated feelings on this one, uh, mostly because there are two major elements in the story which are not to my personal taste. I don't really enjoy reading about them <laughs> pretty much from any author. Um, but aside from that, I'd like to say like more objectively speaking, I think this book is as good as The Day of the Triffids and perhaps a little bit more unusual at the time that it was published. So this is also kind of a post-catastrophe novel, but it takes place hundreds and hundreds of years after a, an apocalyptic event on Earth, probably a huge nuclear war that left vast swaths of the planet uninhabitable and highly toxic and radioactive. And the people who survive really don't have any memories or history to explain what's happened. They know that there was this event, but it's so far in the past for them, and they've been so cut off from other communities that they just don't have a good explanation. Um, and this is set mainly in one community in a place that they call Labrador. I'm gonna guess that it is actual Labrador. Um, and it is a very religious community. The thing about this world is that because of, I guess, the radiation, um, mutation and deviation uh, amongst any sort of organism is very common. So plants and animals and humans are constantly mutating. And in this community in particular, they despise deviation and they have kind of this warped rewritten version of Christian doctrine that states what is a mutation and what is not. And anything that does have an obvious mutation has to be destroyed, or if it's a person and they don't kill that person, exiled to basically death in the fringe lands. So it's a hard life. And this is the first thing that I did not like about this, is there is this streak of religious fundamentalism, which is extremely against any sort of non-conformity. And it also very much is about controlling women and reproduction and women's bodies. And 
to read about women who are constantly giving birth and having their infants destroyed at birth because they have an extra pinky toe or whatever, or someone committing suicide because they can't let go of their child who is going to be killed. It's difficult. <laughs> and then the entire story is about a group of children who have developed telepathy and invisible deviation, and they grow up in this society knowing that if they so much as give a hint to the adults around them that they are different, that they will be killed or exiled. And that's the second thing that I don't particularly love about this is the telepathy. I think I've mentioned this before. I think when I reviewed um, More Than Human by Theodore Sturgeon, I talked about this. Um, I don't really enjoy the whole thing about developing ESP or psionic abilities, how this might be the next evolution of humankind. It's a very, very common element from a lot of science fiction from like the 40s, 50s, 60s and onwards, and I just find it extremely unrealistic and boring. At least the way that it was done here, I think what it's really exploring isn't just what that would be like to develop telepathy, but the impact it has on the characters' lives and how standing out in any way, any sort of nonconformity threatens their lives. And once again, that's pretty dark stuff sometimes. So on the whole, I did like the story and, and the journey that the characters in this went through growing up and trying to decide what to do next. Can they go somewhere where they are safe, where they are accepted? Um, I desperately wanted them to get out, but there was this pall over the whole story for me knowing that not all of these, these kids do escape, some of them do not make it, and that there might be more, and they won't have this option to get away either. I don't want to spoil things, but I kind of want to talk about this at the same time because it's what left a pretty heavy impression on me. So yeah, at rock bottom, I think this is a good book with some elements that weighed my emotions down a little bit, but other people probably won't feel that way. So another one that I would actually recommend if you wanted to give John Wyndham a shot. I realize this is perhaps rather rambly because I did not prepare my thoughts or the points I wanted to make in advance, but that's pretty much it for um, my impressions of these two books, and either I chose very well for my first two John Wyndham novels or his stuff is pretty uniformly good. I hope the latter. Um, but yeah, I will definitely be trying to read The Midwitch Cuckoos and probably The Kraken Wakes next, um, since I have seen those titles a lot. And if you have any thoughts on these books or the ones that I haven't read, please leave me a comment down below. I really haven't heard that much about John Wyndham, especially on booktube, and I would love to talk to people about him. So thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll be back to talk to you again soon, and until then, bye!